After it is designed, but before it can be occupied, a building must be constructed. This is the story of the construction of Milstein Hall at Cornell University. Rising from the interior concrete foundation walls of Milstein Hall is a reinforced concrete dome that encloses critique spaces while simultaneously supporting auditorium seating on its outer surface. This dome appears as an anomalous form within the otherwise orthogonal steel-framed grid comprising the structure for the upper level. It seems to evoke a kind of primal geological upheaval within the Earth's surface, rising up and deforming the tectonic framework above. Of course, Milstein's dome is not really a dome at all. Domes are a particular type of shell structure that, like the two-dimensional arches they resemble, adopt very specific geometric forms that allow them to carry loads to their foundations largely in compression, with some perpendicular tension stresses at the bottom of steep domes. There are other well-known shell geometries that are not domes, like the hyperbolic paraboloid structures made famous by architects like Felix Candela in the 19. 50s and 60s. These forms also have rather strict geometries so that, like traditional domes, they resist mainly compressive and tensile forces and minimize structurally inefficient bending moments. So where does the shape of the Milstein dome come from? Well, it was apparently developed by the architects from a purely programmatic and expressive standpoint. That is, it was designed both to serve a practical purpose and also to look, well, like the architects wanted it to look. There were some general discussions with the structural consultants before the final form of the dome was designed, but no structural calculations were done until the shape of the dome was pretty much set. So these were prepared before any structural design? Yes, before, <laughs> before even our drawings began. And That's this amazing. was the original architectural intent of the project, and you'll see that it hasn't changed too much. That's right. From the architect's model, the structural engineers then needed to create a structural model embodying the same geometry, but now given material specifications. They produced a three-dimensional CAD model, which we then took and imported into our CAD system. And then we had to convert that into a structural model. To perform the structural analysis, a single curved surface is abstracted from the true thickness of the concrete shell, and then this surface is in turn subdivided into a kind of mesh with the lines of the mesh approximately two or three feet apart in this case. The mesh consists of a series of four-sided plates joined in a rigid manner at each node. Using this so-called finite element structural model, an abstraction of the continuous concrete reality, both axial forces and bending moments can be computed at each node and across the surface of each shell element. Uh, each of these uh, small squares, mm -hmm. uh, or rhombuses, I suppose, uh, represents a, a three-dimensional plate of a thickness of 9 or 12 inches, depending on where, where it is. Such a model is highly indeterminate and could not be analyzed without sophisticated digital finite element analysis software. Each degree of redundancy or indeterminacy creates another unknown variable and another equation. What this software does is essentially solve what quickly turns into thousands of simultaneous equations using matrix methods. The structural model includes not only the concrete dome itself, but also the adjacent first floor slab and the complex bridge and stair that penetrate the dome. Also included is a sloping concrete column, shown here before the dome is cast. Ironically, after all the relevant load scenarios are tested on the structural model, the final pattern of reinforcement is remarkably simple and uniform. So this shows not only the reinforcement, but also the stem walls. Yes. Um, at the flat portion, the insulation is placed directly on the structural slab, and the topping slab is poured on it. But at the dome, because of the curved surface, we wanted to restrain the topping slab um, and to give it a little bit more rigidity. And so they place stem walls at four feet on center each way, mm -hmm. um, filled those with insulation, and the topping slab goes on top of it. So that's all what the lines are, and the reinforcement, again, is right here. It's just the typical, I believe it's number nine to nine inch on center each So way. the whole thing is, you basically find the maximum mm -hmm. stress, and it's just and pragmatic and reasonable through. to just mm -hmm. carry that through. So what, say that again, number nines and number nine, nine inch on center. Nine inch center each way, top and bottom. Top and bottom. 
The first step in building the dome is to construct formwork. Because the dome is actually covering critique space located one level below grade, scaffolding is first erected on this basement slab so that the actual wooden forms for the dome can be built starting from grade rather than from the basement. To model the complex curvature of the intended surface, a series of wooden trusses are manufactured based on the dome's geometry. These are conventional prefab wooden trusses made of 2x4s fastened together with nail plates, except that the shapes of these particular trusses have been determined by cutting a series of parallel sections through the architectural model. Because the adjacent first floor slab has already been cast, reinforcing rods can often be seen extending from those slabs, awaiting the construction of the dome formwork so that they can be embedded within the dome's concrete shell. Next, layers of plywood are fastened to these trusses, creating a doubly curved, stable, and rigid base. The final layer is made with smooth-surfaced MDO plywood, since this layer will determine the quality of the interior ceiling. Linear wooden boards placed over this final form surface will become voids in the concrete, corresponding to the location of light fixtures. Naturally, all the electric conduits and holes for sprinklers must also be accounted for before the concrete is placed. The next step is to put the grid of number 9 reinforcing bars over the form. When all the bars are in place, the concrete is placed over the entire surface in one lengthy continuous operation, taking about 12 hours to avoid having any construction joints that would mar the interior finish of the exposed concrete ceiling. Small rebars protrude from the concrete on a four-foot grid to tie into stem walls that will constrain and support a second non-structural concrete topping slab that will be visible from the outside. Such double domes are actually quite common in historic structures, for example in Brunelleschi's Florence Cathedral. Once the main structural dome surface is in place, work can begin on the auditorium seating that climbs up the western slope. First, parallel sets of forms are placed on the sloping dome, then these short vertical walls are cast. The horizontal platforms for the rows of auditorium seats are then cast on the tops of these walls, leaving triangular voids below that are used as plenums to deliver air. Lighting fixtures are also provided in the wall surfaces, as well as a series of horizontal channels manufactured by the British firm Halfen. These are anchored into the concrete in order to provide support for wall-mounted seats with fold-down backs as well as fold-away writing surfaces. Why do the seat backs fold down? Well, based on this rendering made by the architects, it appears that seats not taken can be folded down and used like little side tables. Here's the seat in it. I'm going to sit on it as a test. Actually pretty comfortable and um, it's not really soft and cushiony so it's going to keep you awake while you're uh, at your lectures. A grid of short so-called stem walls are about to be cast over the structural dome to support the outer non-structural concrete surface. But before these walls are cast, Various pipes are put in place, especially sprinkler pipes that will protect the critique spaces below the domed surface, and large stainless steel drain pipes originating at the roof, designed to carry excess rainwater that cannot be absorbed by the planting medium and sedums of the green roof above the second floor studio spaces. These drain pipes move upwards through holes in the second floor slab and then up into the roof deck, connecting to roof drains, shown here with temporary connections, and here in their final form, with a white liner encasing insulation over the actual pipe. Up on the roof, we can see the pairs of drains. One is an overflow or emergency drain next to the regular drain. To see all this in context, the schematic section shows the location of the pipe embedded within the void space above the dome. This pipe extends downward and then out to the storm drains under University Avenue. The pipe also extends upward to connect with the roof drains within the green roof. The arrows show the flow of water from the roof, through the building, and then out to the storm drain, and ultimately into Cayuga Lake. But back to the dome. Waterproofing compounds are applied over the dome beneath the stem wall locations. The stem walls are then cast, mostly between wooden forms with longitudinal ribs formed first. The perpendicular ribs are then cast in a second operation, resulting in a grid of ribs covering the structural dome. Additional waterproofing is then applied to the bottom surface. Rigid polystyrene insulation is cut to completely fill the voids. 
Of course, the insulation itself could just as easily be put in place prior to the stem walls being formed and could, in fact, serve as the formwork for the stem walls. This strategy, not used at first, is employed to cast the remainder of the stem walls. Before the final outer concrete surface of the dome is cast, the adjacent first floor slab must be prepared for its outer surface, since the slab and dome are not only structurally tied together, but also are designed to be architecturally continuous. A primer is applied to the structural slab. Then waterproofing membranes are laid over the primer. In the background, Milstein's sustainable bicycle racks can be seen attached to the underlying structural dome. After a drainage membrane is placed over the waterproofing, several layers of two inch thick rigid insulation are put into place since this slab is actually separating outside space from the basement level below. This view is from the main lecture hall in East Sibley Hall. Another membrane covers the insulation and steel welded wire reinforcement is put into place. Next, wooden forms are placed over the dome and slab anchored in an ad hoc manner using two-by lumber wedged to the soffit above in order to define polygonal control joints within the final concrete surface. These control joints are deliberately formed lines of weakness that direct what would otherwise be random and unsightly shrinkage or temperature-induced cracks into ordered patterns. At this time, circular wooden forms are also put into place to leave voids where so-called pods will go made from hard urethane plastic and lit up from within. Quoting from the Cornell Milstein website, these translucent seating pods add a public urban quality and a sense of warmth, surprise, and ambiance to the covered space. All this can be seen in this screenshot taken from one of Cornell's Milstein Hall web videos. Concrete is then cast into the polygonal spaces defined by the temporary wooden forms, creating a continuous surface extending from the first floor slab up onto the dome, here seen at the bicycle racks, next to the stair that extends up the dome from the entrance to the second floor studios. The circular pod forms are still in place but will soon be removed. Where required control joints were not created with the polygonal formwork, they are cut with a diamond-tipped circular saw after the concrete hardens. In fact, these same saw-cut joints will later be applied even over the original control joints formed by the wooden boards in order to give all the joints the same quality. So in summary, these are the various layers under the final surface of the slab that connects to the dome. Beneath the primer is a structural slab. A waterproofing membrane is applied over the primer. Multiple layers of rigid insulation go next, above a drainage membrane. After another protection membrane is installed, the final outer concrete surface is cast continuously over the first floor slab and up onto the dome. Meanwhile, inside the dome, the formwork begins to be stripped, revealing for the first time the curved interior concrete surface with its holes for sprinkler pipes and slots for lighting fixtures. Later, the permanent light fixtures are installed within the slots. And now that the dome concrete is pretty much completed, the bridge through the dome can be formed and cast. First, the floor of the bridge is formed and reinforced. Then, the complex structural truss-like side rails are formed and reinforced. A mock-up of the rail has been made to ensure that the final result will be acceptable to all. Here we see the actual bridge rails, one side finished and the other side with the concrete cast but the forms not yet stripped. The third leg of the bridge, actually a stair leading down to the basement level, is also cast. Its structural piece is cast first, acting like an angled column from the basement up to the bridge. The actual treads come next. One can see the attention to detail and craft needed to form these curved treads. The formwork itself is like a work of art. All the, way the risers are cut at a 45 degree angle in order to get your trowel underneath it to finish the top of the stairs too. So. From the top of the dome, actually from the second floor studio level, we can now see down the two stairs that are cast into or onto the dome surface. This one leading back down to the main entry of Milstein Hall, and this one leading into the auditorium. Looking in from the eyebrow window at University Avenue, we can see the bridge and dome in their almost completed form. And here is the same eyebrow window and bridge as they appear from inside, 
with the linear light fixtures installed in the curved concrete ceiling.